afterwards or like during. So that's just what I'm doing. Like, don't, don't think I'm like going on Instagram or anything. It's just, you know what, if you're like texting on your phone while I'm doing this presentation, then I'm off. Okay. I'm going <laughs> like, to sharing my screen and I'm going to close my laptop and we're just going to be done with this whole thing. <laughs> no, I would never do that. It would be so rude. I'd feel so bad. <laughs> But I will just throw something up on Instagram real quick, like a slide up story so that people can join. Smile. (laughs) We are live. Hey. Swipe up to join. So did you go to work today? Uh, No, wasn't at work today. I did shoot uh, a couple of TikToks though. So that's why I'm on my scrubs. (laughs) Oh, God. Also, this gotcha, is like gotcha. I mean, I hey, <laughs> you got to have the authentic look, you know, or people like might not take you seriously. Uh, it's true, actually. I went, there were certain um, TikTok segments that I would film just in my normal clothes, and they got like way less views. And I was like, all right, if this is what the people want. <laughs> right, right. <It's>, uh, <laughs> you got to put scrubs on, yeah. or else it's just like, yeah. You gotta do it for the views. You gotta, you gotta do it look for the, the part. You gotta look the part. Exactly. I don't. I feel like the white coat is too much, though. I can't do the white coat. I see some people wearing their white coat too, and I'm like, all right, now that's ridiculous. I know you're not actually wearing that white coat around your house. It is conceivable, <laughs> conceivable that you're just wearing your scrubs around your house. But if you're wearing your white coat, <laughs> see, wow. <laughs> I didn't even know. Like, I yeah. mean, like I like sometimes I'll dress nice if I'm making like TikToks for like Club Med. Yeah. But you're right. If you're kind of like dressed like, you know, like bummy, like people just don't. That's crazy. Yeah, they have a different perception. And there's it's an instantaneous perception too. You know, they just get a like gestalt. They're like, is this person a medical professional? Yeah. It's immediately yeah. answered when you're in scrubs, you know. Yeah, like, why should I take him seriously, you know? Yeah, exactly. Because he's wearing scrubs. He must know exactly. everything. Exactly. <laughs> Precisely. So what do you do on your off days? Do you, like, do anything to relax or are you just... I never relax. I don't... If you can tell, I don't relax. <laughs> I feel kidding. like a lot of people in the medical field are so type A. We are. Like, just cannot relax. I do. I, I have a, a struggle with that. I mean, you'll, you'll see like, as we go along and I talk about my past and stuff like that, I'm like, I'm always doing something. I'm always growing something. And it kind of drives me a little bit crazy. I was talking to my wife about it and, and my parents actually just recently, I'm like, I'm 37, you know? So I'm like, I'm old, but I'm not like 50. And I feel like I'm already going through a midlife crisis. I'm like, there's so much that I want to do. And I have so much little time left. And my parents are like, are you planning on dying in your 50s? No, (laughs) but there's a lot. There's a lot that I want to do. And so I have a problem just like completely relaxing, but I love all of the things that I do. So it's it's an escape. Without relaxing, it's an escape from my brain and a total change from my normal day in, day out experience in the emergency room. Yeah, I get that. Mm. All right. Um. I will just, I think it's been enough time to let people hop on, but I will just go ahead and get started. Oh. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to um, another virtual shadowing session. I see a lot of questions already about summaries, but they are due on June 15, and then we will take a little break before we launch into our official summer segment. Um, but without further ado, Today we have Dr. J. Max Slaughter, a board certified emergency medicine physician, and I will let him take it from here. How did you know that I was a board certified emergency medicine physician? It's almost like it's on the screen right (laughs) now. A wild guess, I swear. In front of you. Um, Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is J. Max Slaughter. Um, I'm an ER doctor with an atypical background. I came from the world of entertainment, actually my whole life until I was no, 21 actually. Until I was 21, I wanted to be an entertainer, TV, film, music. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and this whole doctor thing was kind of an afterthought. But while I'm like a very impulsive person, I make an impulsive decision and I stick to it. Um, and that's what I did to become a doctor and an ER doctor. Uh, as you see down here, I'm also a nonprofit founder and a digital creator. Um, so as we are getting into this, I want you guys 
to find me on Instagram at Dr. J Max Slaughter and on TikTok at Dr. J Max Slaughter underscore MD. It seems a little overkill to have like Dr. J Max Slaughter and then the MD at the end, but I kept doing lives. I kept doing lives and people would be like, are you a doctor? Are you a doctor? And I'm like, it says I'm a doctor. What do you mean? Am I a doctor? And so I put the MD on the end as well. But every time I see that, I kind of cringe. I'm like, maybe I don't need that. <laughs> Uh, so my atypical path to becoming a doctor started with this little blonde haired boy uh, on my mom's lap. I, I grew up in a partridge family. Um, I was three years old when I was on stage singing with my family. My older sister sang, my dad sang and played guitar. And my mom was a very talented uh, percussionist. She was a drummer, but she had terrible stage fright. So she was just a stage manager instead. And then, um, Cut to really embarrassing low res picture of me looking like a middle aged woman with a short haircut. And that <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and that is, uh, that's me at 15. Um, and I was in a boy band, so straight up pop group. Um, we sang, we danced, uh, and we had the worst name on the planet. We were actually put together by um, a radio show and it was going to be a joke. They were going to put together a boy band and like have the audience, uh, the listeners rather, you know, vote on who was going to get into the group and all that stuff. And, and I made it in the group and then we were good. And the radio show was like, let's make some money off these guys. And so they put us on tour with some big acts and we opened up for Bon Jovi and 98 degrees and we toured with destiny's child. So we got to tour with Beyonce, um, which was pretty amazing. And, uh, and that like one thing led to another. And then I ended up in Los Angeles and I did some TV and film out there. I really wanted to pursue music full time, but ended up finding success in TV and film. And I was like, all right, let's just ride this train a little bit. And so, you know, all the while working my tail off, you know, I, I feel like I was a very fortunate person, but I worked my tail off um, from, from really day one that I got into the entertainment business and it paid off. And, uh, and I still, to this day, I'm not making a lot, but I still make what I call mailbox money. So if you're in a TV show or a movie that continues getting played on the air, they have to pay you for it still. So every now and then I'm just walking out to my mailbox and I'm getting my mail and I'm like, skadoosh, and I got to check. Uh, <laughs> they used to be way bigger. They're not very big anymore because this movie came out before you guys were born, I'm sure. But, um, but still really fun to have this in my past. And um, I, I made... A very impulsive decision after i did i did a tv show that was on for a full season i did a movie uh fat albert with keenan thompson as you saw and then i kind of had a decision to make am i going to do this for the rest of my life or should i consider myself lucky to have worked as much as i did in entertainment and find something else because i knew that i didn't want to be an actor when i was 50 years old with a family you know so i was like why wait until I'm 50 and frustrated that I'm not making enough money for my family, which I actually was really not to brag, but I was making pretty good money as a 19 year old, but I knew that that couldn't last forever, you know? And so, and I'd always been very family oriented. And so I made a very impulsive decision to become a doctor. Um, and fortunately it worked out. You can yeah. see <laughs> in this shot right here, this is me getting my white coat and saying, yeah, uh, everybody else was like very reserved. Like, oh, I'm just going to put on my white coat now. And I was like, skadoosh. I was <laughs> obviously just as animated as I always am in the medical field. Um, and then along the way, I, I tried to figure out how to take my experiences in, in entertainment and my passion for music and integrate it into what I was doing at the time, you know, which is medicine and what I do now. And um, I created a nonprofit called Music Meets Medicine. And we donate instruments and free music lessons to kids in children's hospitals. And if we have time later, if you want to hear it, I have a kind of story about, you know, what inspired me to, to start it. Um, but we can keep on trucking and get to more of the medical stuff because I know that's what I'm here to talk about. So med school. Why was I accepted into med school? One, I had great grades and it worked my tail off, right? But everybody that makes great grades and works their tail off does not get into medical school. Right. So I got in because of my outside experience, because of what made me completely unique, not completely, but fairly unique compared to all of the other applicants that year. Mm -hmm. 
not everybody will be in TV and film and not everybody will be a professional musician at some point, but everybody has something that's totally unique about them. And, you know, you guys are still growing up. You guys are still finding yourselves, but there is something totally unique about you and something that you're very passionate about. And I know medicine is that, but find that other thing. Don't just let it be medicine. Find that other thing that you're really passionate about. Um, like for instance, this that I'm talking on right now, med schools are gonna love this. This is great. You have created something. So find something that you're passionate about and create something around it. And that's how you get into med school. So that's how you can learn from me. It's not being TV and film. It's not tour the country, which that will help you if you can do that. <laughs> but you find what you're passionate about and create something around that. And it doesn't have to be the most successful thing on the planet. It can be 200 people that tune into whatever you're doing on a regular basis, but, but find that thing and stick with it. And it'll show that you're a leader and you are. Um, so we can talk a little bit about some cool ER stories. Oh, wait, I was going to say something about my schedule. Did I just skip over that slide? Oh, there it is. There we go. Um, so why did I choose emergency medicine before I even got into, uh, med school, my sister worked as an ER nurse. And that's actually part of the reason why I made the impulsive decision to become a doc is because I would hear all of my sister's cool stories about the ER, about, you know, people getting shot in the neck and walking into an ER. That's not a trauma facility that are not used to handling gunshot wounds. And then they just like stumble and fall on the ground and the ER doctor like jumps on his neck because he's going to bleed out from his carotid if he doesn't squeeze his carotid and put pressure on it. And, uh, and the vascular surgeon just happened to be in house. And so the ER doctor went all the way to surgery with the vascular surgeon with his hand inside this dude's neck with his bare hands squeezing down on his carotid artery. And it saved that guy's life. And I was like, dang, man, that is powerful. And through stories like that, that my sister would tell me, I realized that I want to live those stories. I want to be that guy, you know, and I get to be that guy now. And it's the best thing ever. Um, but I kind of lost sight of that a little bit when I was in med school, because I was rotating through and all of these different specialties seem so awesome. You know, internal medicine seems so great. They go in so in depth with all of this patient's problems. Pediatrics is great. I love working with kids. OB-GYN is great. You get to deliver, get kids. Surgery is great. You get to do invasive, crazy procedures. And then I came back to the original plan because as an ER doc, you get to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You get to do all, and you get to do the most exciting part of all that stuff too. Um, so I'm very, very happy with my decision and it helps that you also get paid fairly well. You know, you shouldn't go into a specialty because of the pay, because it can change a lot, um, during your career. But when you're choosing your specialty, I mean, you guys aren't thinking about this right now, but you make a decision in your twenties, um, about what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And if you're not making a lot of money doing that, it's okay. You don't have to make a lot of money, but you have to make a, su a su sufficient amount of money to, to, you know, kind of promote whatever lifestyle you want, but you put yourself in a box really for the rest of your career in medicine, because it's very hard to switch between fields. So if you decide to go into one of the low paying fields, because it's your passion, I commend you. I take my hat off to you, but your 55 year old self is going to have to live with that decision. And at one point, you may realize, I wish I had more opportunities that I could give my kids, or mm -hmm. I wish that I could travel places and I can't afford to because I chose this low paying specialty. So I'm not saying go into a specialty because of the money, but be aware of that and, and be aware of the fact that the decision you make in your 20s is going to affect you for the rest of your career. And you may have a different perception as you get older. I got lucky because I, I was not aware of the pay at all. And it's not amazing pay. I'm not like trying to say, I had paid so much money, but I'm very happy with my pay. But I, I chose to go into ER because it was right for me. And it just happened to also, um, you know, be financially profitable. So what is my schedule like? Um, as an ER doc, my schedule is all over the place. I work days. I work nights. I work mornings. I work evenings. Some days I get up at... 4 30 a.m to go to a super early shift right actually earlier than that there's one 5 a.m shift that i do so i have to be at the hospital at five so i get up at like four or a little bit before because it's a little bit of a drive 
there are other days where my shift starts at 1.30 p.m. There are other days where my shift starts at 11 p.m. So I am all over the place. But what's cool about ER is that it's schedulable. So my life, I know what my weird hours are going to be like two months in advance. So I can schedule anything I want around that. And I do. I do a lot of stuff outside of medicine. I have three kids um, and a wife. And so we, we schedule a lot of stuff and I do my nonprofit work and this and that. So um, mm -hmm. ER is kind of a cool field because not only is it schedulable, but you are a clock in, clock out worker. So it's called shift work. I, anyone else that is ER, you know, board certified can do my job in my ER, which is good and bad, right? <laughs> Cause you also want to be indispensable. But uh, in our particular group, we have a certain number of docs. And at any time I can be like, hey, um, my kid has this performance in two days. Can someone cover my shift? Or can I work that super early shift so I can get off in time to go to my kid's thing? Right. And we do a good job of supporting each other's lifestyles. We want each other to be happy and we want each other to, we, we want, we all want that support. So we're, we all do a good job about switching around and stuff like that. So that's pretty awesome. Not everybody can do, not every specialty can do that, you know? Right. Um, so let's get to some cool cases. So before we talk about this case, I just wanna show you guys a normal chest X-ray, okay? because you're about to see a very abnormal chest x-ray. I'm sure docs have gone over this with you. Can you see my little pointer? Yep. Ah, uh, oh, sweet, that is perfect. Okay, so um, you're looking for a couple of things when you're looking at a chest x-ray. Uh, you wanna be systematic. I'm not gonna teach you a, a certain way that you have to look at chest x-rays, but whatever you do, do it the same way every time because if you don't, you're gonna end up missing something because yeah. you'll see there have been cases of radiologists missing glaring issues because they are, if they're not systematic about it, you can just miss things. We're all human, we all make errors, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I like to look at the bones first. Are there any huge fractures? Are there any masses? Is anything displaced, right? Got to look at both sides. All right, you're looking at each rib. I'm not seeing anything crazy. I'm looking at the front and back portion, the anterior and posterior that is. You're looking at the clavicles, right? Okay, and I like to take my eye down. This is the trachea right here. This is where, uh, this is your windpipe, right? This is where all the, the oxygen flows in, the carbon dioxide flows out, and you can watch it um, split right here. That's called the carina right there into the main um bronchi right there okay um and then you look for a pneumonia you look for an infiltrate okay so are you seeing any big kind of whitish opacities is what we call them you're looking in all um the lung fields right here i'm not really seeing anything and now this is important because this is what we're really going to go over in a second um i like to look and see if there's a pneumothorax or a popped lung so you you take the the vessels here these little vessels and you just fall them out to the edge and this is the best way to make sure that this isn't a popped lung so i can follow all these blood vessels all the way to the edge all right if you can't you'll see a line hint hint you're about to see a line in a minute uh, <laughs> and so i'm following it all the way out to the edges no issue while we're at it we look at the heart okay it's not a very enlarged heart and then you also look here's the diaphragm right here and you see how it dips down on both sides and if there's fluid in the pleural space that is this place between the lung and the chest wall you'll see some fluid there or you'll see a ton of fluid right <laughs> mm -hmm. um okay so that's a good just kind of quick overview for chest x-rays now let me tell you a story so i'm in the er and we hear nurse to triage nurse to triage and that basically means like somebody either has chest pain, they're worried about a stroke or somebody's super sick, right? And this was more of a frantic nurse to triage. This was like, nurse to triage, nurse to triage. And so the only person that was available was this older nurse. And, um, and man, God, I think he was in his 60s. I think he even retired and came back to us for a little while. But he runs out to the front. This is when I'm working in a, a rural ER. And, uh, and the, the granddaughter of a man is, you know, pulled up right in front of the ER. And the grandfather is the door is open, his seatbelt is on, but he's like hanging out because he's so weak, he can't even hold his body up. Um, yeah, this is a bad sign, obviously. Right, right. <laughs> so the nurse 
um, you know, very carefully by himself, undoes the seatbelt. This is not a small guy either. And gets behind uh, the guy's shoulders and slowly tries to get him down into a wheelchair. And again, the guy is so weak, he can't even hold his head up. So the wheelchair is here and his head is over here. I mean, his head is like hanging off the side and he starts wheeling him through my ER. And at that point, after my 11 years of training, the most important thing that I had to do in that moment was make sure that that dude's head didn't like whack the wall <laughs> and end up with like a cervical spine fracture or a closed head injury, right? So my, I'm running behind them and I'm just holding that dude's head up so it doesn't but hit you something. Can't. You can have him leaving <laughs> worse than when he got there. I know, exactly, exactly. And so we're wheeling him in and we put him in one of our bigger bays. So anytime somebody is like super sick, we put him in one of the bigger rooms. Okay. So we put him in um, trauma two basically. And um, it takes, you know, basically we're like, help, help everybody, everybody. And we're just like calling the cavalry. And you know, the ER can be a very frustrating place for people because they're sitting in the waiting room and they've watched other people go in front of them, which we, we bring people back based on how close to, to Jesus they are, you know? And so people with like little toe sprains and stuff, they can wait for a long time. And so they get frustrated. But if you are dead or dying, there is no other place on the entire planet than you want to be than an ER because you're going to get like 20 able-bodied professionals of varying specialties around you immediately. You have your nurses, you have your techs, you have the radiologists, you have phlebotomists, you have, so just docs, obviously, we all descend upon that person who needs us in that moment. Um, and that is when the ER shines. That is when the ER just kills it in their job. So we, you know, have whatever 15 people in the room all of a sudden and we pull this guy up on the bed and we start to get him on the monitor is what's it's called so you so you have um a, a monitor that has all of the vital signs right um and a lot of times you'll see the cardiac rhythm on there as well the heart rhythm see the oxygen levels see um the carbon dioxide levels etc um and this particular patient we started putting him on the monitor and as expected his vital signs looked horrible his oxygen levels were like in the 70s. His heart rate was racing. It was like in the 130s. His blood pressure was low. It was like in the 70s systolic, um, looking really bad, right? And this actually was around the time of COVID. So actually, uh, right when COVID started. And so once, once we wheeled him in and everybody's getting there, everybody's like putting stuff on and I get this like disposable stethoscope, right? So this really crappy quality stethoscope and I put it on his lungs and I'm like, I think... I think it's decreased on this one. I'm not really sure. I don't know. Maybe let's just shoot a chest x-ray just in case. Um, because there's one thing, you know, that, that there are a couple of things that will get somebody to that, to that level of illness um, that an ER doc is kind of always thinking about. And this is what his chest x-ray looked like. Oh so first of all, just ignore this side that looks completely horrendous. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but over here, remember, we talked about the pulmonary vasculature, right? So here are the blood vessels. We're following, 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 bunk. We're following those blood vessels, bunk. We're following, following, bunk. So this is the pleural line. That's the line of the lung. All of this space in here is empty space, basically. Um, there's supposed to be a space around the lung, but you're not even supposed to see it. It's, so, it's supposed to be so small, and it's supposed to be a negative pressure space so the fact that the pressure is negative is pulling the lung open but this person has what's called a pneumothorax which is a popped lung and this is a big problem um because it's not only a pneumothorax it is judging by his vitals and also judging by this horrendous x-ray turning into a tension pneumothorax okay so again pneumothorax is air in the thorax where it's not supposed to be Another thing you can get is a hemothorax. So you can get blood or fluid, uh, well, blood for hemothorax um, and pleural effusion in this space as well, which would just be fluid. So <clears throat> another thing that you can see on this chest x-ray, actually that you can't see because this guy was so sick, we didn't have time to get a beautiful chest x-ray. We just shot this. I saw, I confirmed kind of the diagnosis and I went to town on what we needed to do to save this guy's life. But he would, if we could see the rest of this x-ray, have something called a deep sulcus sign. So one side of his diaphragm, if we were a little lower, would go to around here. Actually, you may be able to see it. No, you can't really see it on this. It's just so schmutzy over here. 
Um, but you'd see the diaphragm doing this nice little tiny point right here. And somebody who has a deep sulcus sign, it just keeps going down, right? Where that diaphragm is. It just keeps going down, 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 down. And that, again, is just from the air that is outside of the lung and inside of the chest wall. And the big, big problem here is that it's turned into this tension pneumothorax. And the difference between a tension pneumothorax and a normal pneumothorax is that the tension pneumothorax is starting to compress the lung and then shift all of the structures of the mediastinum, that's kind of the central structures of your chest, over to the other side. So not only is this lung not capable of adequately exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide, because again, that's the basic function of the lungs, exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. This is doing a real crappy job of this, but this side is doing a really bad job too. Now this guy has cancer and has other reasons for it to look this bad, whoops, on the right side. Um, but even in a normal healthy person, this lung would look somewhat clear, but be compressed a lot more. So that lung is unable to do its job because this lung is pushing on that side. And to make things worse, all of this pressure is also pushing on the vena cava, right? So you have your superior vena cava that leads down to the heart, the big, basically the biggest vein that you have in your body, and the inferior vena cava that comes up from below, all right, come down here and dumps into your heart, right? So both of these dump into your right atrium. So when you get enough pressure, then you start collapsing the blood vessels that are supposed to return blood to the heart. And guess what? If you can't return blood to the heart, you can't push blood out to the rest of your body. So you basically end up with this like pumping mechanism that doesn't have any blood entering it. And if there's no blood entering it, there's no blood coming out and you die. Mm -hmm. So this guy needed a uh, thoracostomy. So um, there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. If you're in the field, so EMS providers can do this, or sometimes like combat medics can do this. We need to get the air that's in here out of the chest. That's the only way that the lungs are gonna reinflate and that pressure is gonna come off of the vena cava. So there are two ways to do it. In your second intercostal space, that is the second uh, rib between your um, the second and third rib, you can take a long needle. So basically the same needle that you put to start an IV, as long as it's thick enough. So you get like a 16 gauge or even a 14 gauge needle, the longest one you got, and you just stab it into their chest. You stab it into that second intercostal space and then you pull the needle out. And if everything goes according to plan and if they're not too chunky, because if there's a lot of sub-Q tissue, you might not be able to get all the way into that pleural space. You pull out the needle and then the, the catheter is still in there just like you would have in an IV. There's a little plastic tube that's stuck in somebody's vein after you pull the needle out. That's what you'd be able to do for here. And if it's successful, you'd hear a and that is the air coming out. Now, it's not a definitive treatment because those can end up getting clotted off. But if somebody is about to die, that's the move to make. If you're in an emergency room, you don't have to do that. I mean, technically, like on my board exams, I would say that I would do, it's called a needle decompression. I'd say, yeah, I'm going to do a needle decompression at the midclavicular line on the second intercostal. But really, when you're in an ER, you have a scalpel right next to you. So it would take just as much time to stab somebody's chest up here as it is to cut into their chest down here. Now, this is called a thoracostomy, okay? Or a chest tube. Chest tube is, is the is the, the name that everybody knows. So you find the fifth intercostal space. If somebody's dying in front of you, you're not gonna be like, oh, here's the first rib. Oh, here's the second You're not gonna count oh, it out. Right, yeah, you're like, give me some time, give me some time now. No, you just find their nipple, you go lateral to it, and you do it at the mid axillary line, okay? This is your axilla right here, okay? Your armpit. So you you just draw a line between your armpit and somebody's nipple, and that's what you're going to cut. You try to feel, try to feel those ribs if you can, but you might not be able to, and that's just fine. You just start slashing because this person's dying in front of you. So you cut, 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 cut. Um, if you can, if you have time, you put numbing medicine in there, right? Lidocaine, bupivacaine, something like that. But if they're dying in front of you, again, your job is to save their life by any means necessary. So for this particular patient, I didn't even numb them up. I just cut down into their chest and I didn't even have time to get all of my tools ready. I'll tell you the proper way to do it, but I'll tell you the way that I had to do it in that moment to save his life. And that's cut down all the way to 
is muscular layer. And I'm avoiding these right here because you can see this is the nerve, the artery, and the vein. And those are under the ribs. So that's why every time we're cutting in um, and trying to place a chest tube or trying to pop into this space that's filled with air, we avoid directly under the rib. Now, worst case scenario, you hit it. Sorry, still saved your life, right? That's kind of mm -hmm. like the, the brutality of emergency medicine as we get yeah. to these moments where it's like, there's the right way to do it. And then there's the way to save somebody's life. And this was just the way to save somebody's life. So we just cut, 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 get down to this muscular layer right here and literally take your finger, put your finger in that hole and you push <laughs> until you pop in to this space right here between the lung and the chest wall. And if you do it right, you can pull your finger down a little bit and then you'll hear like, and that's what we heard in this guy. And it was just like, and then I let it go. And I was like, maybe there's some more in there. And I moved my finger again. It was like, and I was like, Jesus, there's so much in there. Um, and then maybe one more time, right? And then, and then I inserted the chest tube, okay? And so now we saved his life. You can immediately watch his vital signs change. His heart rate went down. His oxygen levels went up. His blood pressure improved as well. Uh, it wasn't nothing was totally normal, but everything looked way better. Um, mm -hmm. And then still, while he's kind of out of it, he's just really starting to perfuse his brain because if your blood pressure is low, your your body is not getting a lot of blood flow to your brain, so people can get really confused and out of it. Which is why that dude was like stumped, slumped over, and couldn't hold himself up at all because literally his brain was not getting enough blood flow for him to be able to control his body. So at this point, we've cut down. And, um, and we can put a tube in. And the correct way to do this is to not use your finger. Again, it's acceptable to, but the correct way to do it is to pop in with a blunt instrument like these Kellys, okay? So these Kellys is kind of a curved hemostat, all right? Those hemostats are like the needle drivers that you use to suture with. Um, and so these are curved hemostats that you grab and in an ideal situation, you hit the rib with it. So you know exactly where you're going. Here's the rib, you hit the rib and then you go just right over it. Because again, if we go under it, then we're messing up these people, this person's nerves, arteries uh, and veins potentially forever, right? Mm -hmm. So you're popping through that space over the rib and then into that pleural space and those Kellys go in and then your hemostats open up. This is, this is the, a brutal part. Um, you open up your hemostats and then you rip through the muscle tissue. So you're like spreading the muscle tissue yeah. because you now have to put a tube in there, right? right? So you then take your Kelly's, you grab your tube, you take another clamp and you put it on the other side of the tube because in a trauma situation, that could be blood that you're evacuating. And yeah. if you just put an open tube in there, it's like basically a giant pixie stick, you know, um, <laughs> whatever's in there is gonna come gushing out, right? And so there have been uh, many an ER and trauma docs shoes that gets uh, completely ruined by blood after you pop into this cavity. If it's a hemothorax, that is blood in the pleural space. So you put this tube in there and then you basically hook it up to suction and then it'll suck all that um, air out and another life saved. And you basically suture it in. So it's an intense uh, procedure, but it is so immensely satisfying. Because here you can see after the chest tube was placed, I'm going up through that fifth intercostal space and it's making its way back here. Um, the lung now, now let's follow those vascular markings, right? All the way to the edge. This is almost immediately after putting the tube in. All the way to the edge, all the way to the edge. And then a couple of minutes later, the guy starts waking up and he's like, what happened? And I'm like, you almost died, dude. <laughs> What are some causes for why this happens? Good question. So trauma, anytime somebody gets a stab wound to the chest, air can then come in from the outside environment into that pleural space. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously a problem because the exact same thing can happen. You end up getting uh, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax because as it's cutting in, you can sever some of the blood vessels, which can either pour to the outside or pour to the inside or just kind of create a a hematoma and spread in the subcutaneous tissue there. Other causes for a popped lung in general include um, COPD. So people with emphysema, um, and chronic bronchitis, specifically emphysema, end up having these things called bullae or blebs rather, sorry, blebs, 
which is when the lining of the lung gets really weakened over time because they've smoked so much, they've broken down all the tissue and all the tissue in their lungs is just like frail, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the wall of the lung, instead of being like nice and elastic, has like this, like a bulge in it. It's like a bubble. So it's called a bleb, this bubble. And then somebody with COPD is coughing. <coughs> <coughs> Pop, it bursts. And what, what can turn a normal pneumothorax into a tension pneumothorax is when the air continues to flow into that space between the lung and the chest wall. So somebody with the bleb is, could be set up for this situation where it can, you know, basically be like a one-way valve to where every time he breathes in, the bleb opens up, the air goes through. And then when, you know, he breathes out, it, it closes. So if air is going into the space around where that popped, but then isn't coming back out, it just keeps pushing, pushing, pushing until the lungs collapsed. And then the vessels leading to the heart collapse. And then you did, right? Um, kind of other reasons for it. This is actually really rare, but I was interviewed on like BBC um, live for this. Um, and I had, uh, it was a viral article actually that, that went worldwide. Um, but I saw a patient, this is so, so rare. This is absurdly rare, but that's why I got a lot of attention. I saw a patient that had gone to a One Direction concert, went to a boy band concert, which is like kind of funny happenstance because I was in a boy band, you know, like I know all about boy band. Right. So, <laughs> but so this person was screaming so hard at a One Direction concert that they literally screamed their lungs out. They, they popped both of their lungs. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And they even, that? Isn't that funny? It's so rare, but it happens. And then she also had what's called pneumomediastinum. So she had, um, here, let me show you a normal chest x-ray. Bing, bing, bing. Pneumomediastinum is when there's air around the heart, between the heart and like the sac that the heart is sitting in. So mm -hmm. that was a pneumomediastinum that she had. And she also had a pneumoretropharyngeum, which is like air back here in her neck. And so she was feeling really short of breath and everything. And it was all because she just screamed so hard that she screamed her lungs out. So <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, I could see how that would end up in the news. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, yeah, I called. What did I call it? I, I I called the article "Screaming Your Lungs Out: A Case of Boy Band Induced Pneumomediastinum, Pneumothorax, and Pneumoretropharyngeum." And so, like the people for like a uh, kind of like science, science now, and like a uh, different different science like you know, online journalisms, it caught their eye. And so they all started publishing it and sharing it. Mm -hmm. But, but that's super rare. The only other cases really that I, when I read about it, that, that experienced that, or there was like um, a drill sergeant who was like screaming at his <laughs> oh, <laughs> private. It's kind of worse than the boy band. Yeah. Fall in line private. Yeah. He's like screaming so hard that he popped his own lung. Um, and, uh, and like a opera singer, I think did it too. So it's rare, but it happens. Um, so another case that we can talk about. How are we doing on time, by the way? I'm totally unaware of time. Uh, it's only 837. You're good. Okay, good, good. So another case, um, since we're talking about lung issues, is respiratory distress. This is more classic. Um, although a pneumothorax is classic, I don't see those every day. But mm -hmm. as an ER doc, you just have to be ready for that at all times, right? Um, but so uh, respiratory distress due to asthma or emphysema is very common. And you need to be able to recognize when people are in respiratory distress because those people obviously are gonna need a little bit more 11, right? Not all of them are gonna come in and their oxygen levels are gonna be low. And you're like, I think there's a problem with the lungs, you know? So you need to be able to recognize when they're having difficulty. Different ways that you can recognize that they're having an issue. Like when I saw this two-year-old asthmatic, it came in, first of all, like just terrible wheezes He's breathing in and out that I could hear with my stethoscope and his oxygen levels were low, but I was aware of it. I, I was aware that he was working hard um, before I even listened to his lungs or saw his oxygen levels because he's breathing with his whole body. Usually your diaphragm is doing all the work. Your diaphragm is that muscle that's right below your lungs. And it's kind of a circular muscle, kind of circle here, circle here. And then every time it contracts, it flattens out, expands the lungs. <gasps> As the lungs expand, oxygen's pulled in. As the diaphragm relaxes, the uh, CO2 is pushed out mm -hmm. and that's its job, right? But if the diaphragm is doing everything that it can and your carbon dioxide levels 
are like super high in your body and in your bloodstream, your body recognizes that and or if your oxygen levels are low, in this case, it was both, um, you start compensating. And this is how you compensate. You kind of rock back and forth. You get supraclavicular retractions. It's kind of hard to do, but basically the muscles above the clavicle are like trying to flex you can get intercostal retraction <gasps> between your ribs. Those, those muscles, your intercostal muscles are also flexing. You are using your belly to breathe. So kids do this a lot. Kids will, <clears throat> they start using their belly to try to just like suck in a tiny bit more oxygen and push out just a little bit more carbon dioxide. Um, and then little babies will also nasal flare. So they'll be like, <clears throat> That's funny for me. To, um, but they'll work really hard, right? So you see somebody in severe respiratory distress, you see all of these things. Somebody who's in mild respiratory distress, you may only see that belly popping in and out. But you need to be able to recognize that because that's, that is a child who is going to need a little extra love medically. And you're going to want to watch a little bit more. You don't want to send those home because they can go home. Mama doesn't know what to look out for. And then that kid does very poorly, right? So this two-year-old comes in working ridiculously hard to breathe. And he's starting to get like really tired too, which when your carbon dioxide levels are very high in your bloodstream, it makes you tired and it makes you confused. Also, if your oxygen levels are low for long enough, as we saw with that dude that I had to cut into his chest, um, you start getting really tired, right? And also it's like running a marathon, man. You can only do it for so long. You know, at <laughs> some point, somebody's muscles are gonna start petering out. And this kid was petering out. And that is a very, very bad sign, a very scary, scary sign. Um, so this kid's like laying to the side and he's like barely responding to us when we're like sternal rubbing him and stuff. This is last week, by the way, this was like at one in the morning, um, woke me up for sure. Anytime you see a little baby that is like really sick, it'll wake you right up. Um, and so we start administering medicines to make this baby better. Anybody on the live, anybody know what kind of medicines we would want to give to help this baby get better? Um, while you guys are guessing, I'm going to talk about the different things that we can um, support somebody's respiratory status with. Okay. So somebody that's working this hard needs help pushing air in and pulling air out, right? The very, the first and most basic thing that you can do for somebody in respiratory distress is give them, it's called positive pressure. So you want to push more air into their lungs. Again, this kid had a problem pushing air in and pulling it out, but you want to push more air into their lungs. And the way to do that is you can do a nasal cannula that's specially formulated to push a significant amount of air in. So not just put a little bit of air in, just a little bit of flow. You just need a little oxygen. No, you need pressure. You need that force. So you can get positive pressure through a special kind of nasal cannula. You can also put on a mask, right? That's then hooked up to a machine that can either do what's called CPAP, which is when you force air in and you have positive pressure or BiPAP, which is when you force air in and you pull air out, which is what this kid needs. This kid needed BiPAP because he needed that carbon dioxide out and that oxygen in. And the reason why the positive pressure alone ends up helping people is because when they tire out or you know, if they're in a bad way or they just have a ton of you know, uh, infection in their lungs, not all of their lungs are fully recruited, right? You have all these little sacs in your lungs called alveoli and they, they, some of them may be flattened out because of positioning or infection or this or that. Um, and so to get all hands on deck, you need to open up those little sacs. Again, those are called alveoli or alveolar sacs. And that positive pressure recruits the rest of that lung tissue. And so actually this kid started doing a lot better when we got that positive pressure, but there were some medicines that we gave before that, that started turning them around. What medicines are we getting guesses on? Um, someone said a class of stimulants. Um, Good. Albuterol. Good. Bronchodilators. Yes, great. Yeah. yeah, you guys are killing it. Okay, great. So um, bronchodilators, absolutely. Um, so you have bronchodilators like albuterol, okay? <laughs> um, and that is specifically inhaled bronchodilators. So anybody with asthma knows albuterol very well because that's the rescue inhaler, right? Mm -hmm. um, the inhaled steroids people use for asthma as well, but the inhaled steroids aren't gonna save somebody when they're dying in front of you, right? So use that and another medicine called epitropium. They put them together in one formulation called a duoneb. And so you're giving both at the exact same time through a high flow mask. A lot of times that's enough to turn an asthmatic around. 
um, in conjunction with steroids. You give IV steroids or you give them by mouth, but if somebody's sick enough, sick enough you got to give them IV. Um, and that eventually helps with inflammation, but steroids take a long time to really have effect. So you got to uh, inject the steroids and then, you know, a significant amount of time later, that's really going to help their course. Um, stimulants, you're absolutely right. You give a stimulant like epinephrine, um, and that is one going to help kind of bron bronchodilate. Um, but you are, you're also aiding in their mental status as well. So, you know, the most important thing is bronchodilation and epinephrine helps with that, which epinephrine is pure adrenaline and you give it intramuscular. So you give it into the muscle and adults at 0 0.3 milligrams. I am, and you stab them basically. And this kid started waking up right after we hit him with the epinephrine, um, because it's very quick acting and that, uh, intramuscular epinephrine is the same thing that you use in EpiPens that you'll use for anaphylaxis, which we see in the ER all the time. If somebody's having an allergic reaction to shellfish or peanuts and boom, um, that intramuscular epinephrine really helps other medicines that we can give, um, magnesium, uh, is helpful in severe asthmatics or COPDs. Um, terbutaline is another one. You guys are absolutely right. Bronchodilation all day long. It's the most important thing. So with bronchodilation, the intramuscular epinephrine and the respiratory support through BiPAP and CPAP, we turn this kid around. And by the time we sent him, because I work at adult hospitals, but obviously we need to be ready because anything can come through the door from birth to you know, death basically um, little old people. So, um, so by the time we got this kid sent to the children's hospital, he was looking amazingly better. And, uh, the kid ended up doing very well, fortunately. Yeah. Let's see. Um, so I have, uh, just a couple other things we could talk about real quick. This is kind of funny. So if you guys, you know, if you guys are going into medicine right now, you're going into medicine at a really funny time where everybody thinks they know everything because they just like Googled something real quick. And obviously not all information is created equal. And so we end up with ridiculous home remedies in the ER all the time. This one was particularly ridiculous. Somebody came in for a dislocated toe, their toe is dislocated. The bone is sticking a different direction. It is not in the socket. And what in God's name is that supposed to do to fix a <laughs> dislocated <laughs> toe? Is that a banana? <laughs> well, it looks like a crushed banana, but it's like this weird like cocoa butter like salve that somebody put on it thinking it was gonna fix their dislocated toe. And so you end up with ridiculous stuff like this and you have to really try not to laugh at them. But I had to, I was like, what did you think was going to help this? And, uh, and she just laughed and she was like, well, it wasn't really me. It was my mom. My mom wanted to put it on there. And I'm like, okay, tell your mom, this is not how you fix broken and dislocated bones. Okay. Um, but this one, fortunately, is really easy to put back together. After I got over the slipperiness of it, the procedure popping it back in place was way hard because it's so slippery from this random schmutz on there. But you basically just uh, pull pull the toe to length. You try to kind of exaggerate uh, the direction that it was pushed off in, and then you pull back and around, and it popped in really easily. Um, and then I just had another quick slide about how um, – you have to listen to your patients because <laughs> this one girl had been talking to her primary care doc and in, in urgent care um, for like, it was something like eight months or nine months. And she's like, I think I'm pregnant. She had this like huge distended belly, you know, and she keeps going in and people are like, uh, no, you're not pregnant. Nope. Nope. You're not pregnant. Sorry. You're not pregnant. And then she's like, well, then something's wrong. Like, why isn't anybody telling me what's wrong? And everybody thought that she's a little crazy, I think. Um, and there actually is a medical condition called pseudosiesis. Um, so pseudosiesis is when somebody's brain tricks them into thinking that they're pregnant and they actually will have like hormonal changes associated with pregnancy, even though they're totally not pregnant. And, um, and so, you know, the breast, breast tissue will kind of grow and swell and they'll actually like have pain in their belly and stuff. And, and, you know, the, they will kind of look distended as well. And so everybody just thought she had pseudosiesis. Um, and then I saw her and I was like, well, clearly there may be something wrong with you. Seeing as this has been going on for nine months and no baby has come out. So I did a CAT scan and it was a massive cyst, a massive Huge. ovarian cyst 
So actually tumor, I should say, it's more than just a cyst. This is an ovarian tumor. So there's this huge mass that arose on her ovary. And this is a CAT scan. See, uh, think about taking a slice starting here and just like just cutting straight down the body. So we're looking at, this is the rib cage right here, the edges of the rib cage. This is the liver right here. The intestines are just like squished up against the edges of the abdomen because the whole belly is just being taken up by this massive ovarian cyst right now. Um, and so fortunately, these can be drained. These can be taken out. So this went to an OBGYN and she ended up doing very well. Um, but you know, my lesson here is listen to your patients. <laughs> listen to the patients and prove, prove, trust, but verify, you know, like verify that it's pseudosiesis first before you're like, okay, you're crazy. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't he like, if it's been eight to nine months, why hadn't anyone thought of doing a scan like earlier? I don't know. Just kind of her, she's, she's crazy. Fake pregnant for like eight months. Yeah. Oh, that's I mean, crazy. It's just so funny, but her belly was, I mean, it was terribly distended. Um, it's funny too, because I have people come into the ER also, the exact opposite situations who have this huge distended belly. And I'm like, how far along are you? And they're like, I'm not pregnant. Like, are you, are you sure? Really? Yeah, yeah. Cause I think you're pregnant, you know? <laughs> oh uh, so that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. Any questions or anything? What do you want to go over? Um, that was awesome. Like, Woo! thank you so much for showing us all these cool places and like explaining everything. That was, that was super neat. I really enjoyed that. You're welcome. Um, I have fun doing it. Um, where did you go for undergrad and med school? I went to undergrad at uh, TCU in Fort Worth, mm -hmm. which like nobody used to know about, but now is like kind of on the map for people, mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse, because their uh, like tuition has like tripled since I went there. <laughs> um, but uh, but I went to undergrad at TCU, and then I went to medical school at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Okay, okay. That's and I did residency at UT Southwestern in Parkland as well. All right. Um, lots of thank you. So that's awesome. Um, hey, you're welcome. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions, but if you guys like think hey. anything, well, that's good because that means you explained everything really well. So I'm just such a good, I just did such a good job. That's why no one has any questions because I did such an amazing job. <laughs> but if you guys think of anything, of course, like go follow the Instagram. Follow. Go follow the TikTok. He got dressed up for the TikToks today. So yeah. obviously you can go check it out. <laughs> um, but again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Slaughter. We really appreciate you taking your time out to speak with us. I had a blast. Yeah, just like to wrap up real quick, guys, um, the summaries are due on June 15, and then we will take a few weeks break and we will launch into the summer session. So I will see you guys hopefully next week. Bye, everybody. Follow me.